The Court of Appeals Division I is now in session. Good morning. Please be seated. This is the time set for oral argument in Berghoff v. Gertz, our cause number 1CACV20-0623. Each side has 20 minutes for oral argument, and you're responsible for watching your own clock and saving whatever time for rebuttal you deem appropriate. If you're ready to proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court, Bob McCurgan on behalf of the appellants, Mary Gertz and Douglas McKinney, their husband and wife. I'm going to refer to them as Gertz. And I would like to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. In reviewing the briefs, I'm sure you're wondering why my client litigated a $49,000 dispute. The thought had occurred to us. And the fact of the matter is they didn't know the money, and they weren't going to be bullied into paying money that Berghoff was not entitled to. My clients tried to resolve this pre-litigation. This is noted in the arbitrator's decision. But Berghoff wanted Gertz to pay the $49,000 in dispute before they would even talk about a resolution. That's noted in the arbitrator's ruling. When Gertz refused, Berghoff filed suit and brought a claim for $49,000, saying we've provided landscaping services and product that you haven't paid for. They put a lien on Gertz's house. They filed a recorded day notice of Liz Pendens. Gertz answered and counterclaimed, saying, look, we paid for plants that you never delivered. We prevailed on that issue. We paid for a number of trees that were dead and diseased. We won on that issue. And we laid out other offsets and counterclaims. The parties agreed to arbitrate. Berghoff did not want to have the arbitrator decide the fee issue. That was reserved for the trial court. We arbitrated. The arbitrator agreed that approximately 40% of the offsets that we had raised were valid. It was in the amount of $48,000 and change. Berghoff is then awarded $779. Isn't that a net judgment right there? The $700. I'll refer to it as $700. That's the net judgment, right? Well, I think the way the net judgment rule works, and this is where I want to. I didn't ask you what the rule was. I just asked you, isn't that the net judgment? I would call that a judgment in favor of Berghoff. Correct. The net judgment. Yes. So he won. Or they won. They got $700. Your clients got zero. No, our clients. They were asking for money, right? Our clients were awarded $48,000 in offsets. Right. But the end result is a net judgment for that side, right? Right. But look, can I give you an example as to why I think the application of the rule is different when the claims are intertwined versus independent claims? But isn't that just a different rule? Isn't that just where we look at the totality of the arguments raised and everything else, and it's a litigation rule and not just a net judgment rule? Well, if you look at the language in Trollope, which is where the net judgment rule started, it says, a party will be successful if he obtains a judgment, here $779, for an amount in excess of the setoff or counterclaim allowed, here $48,000. I'm not even sure the net judgment rule is truly a rule. Determination of the successful party is a matter of discretion. Correct. So if you're arguing that the determination here was an abuse of discretion, I mean, it may be that the net judgment rule is a guide to discretion that's been well trodden, but it's not really a binding rule. We're talking about applying a statute that has a discretionary component. So are you saying then that the abuse of discretion occurred because of an error of law, or are you saying that it occurred because of some unconscionable disregard of fundamental principles of justice? Well, I'm saying that the trial court misapplied the net judgment rule, which is an error of law, which is reviewed de novo. But I guess my point is, does that even matter? The net judgment rule seems to me to be less of a rule and more of a guideline, more of 
uh, an advisory sort of rubric. I, I, I don't see that it's binding. It, it finds no support in statute, and it uh, it has never been held by by case law to govern. Uh, it's simply a guide for the exercise of discretion. So here the court exercised its discretion. Candidly, I might have exercised mine very differently, but how does how does that lead us to a reversal in this case? Well, then I, if 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 the court believes the net judgment rule is not a legal principle that wants well, it, to, it's a legal principle, but it's not. It doesn't occupy the field. I think, and tell me if you disagree, but it seems to me that a court could reject the net judgment rule. Correct. Um, and, apply and just decide to proceed on some other discretionary factors without violating any law. Right. Okay. That's correct. And, then, and there's a case cited by either Berghoff or, or, or our side that says a trial court, when addressing this, could use the net judgment rule or the totality of the circumstances or the percentage of success. Right. And, they, and the judge has, trial court judge has discretion which way to go. In this case, the trial court judge decided to use what he considered the net judgment rule, which was incorrect. Because okay. if I give you the example, seller sells a million widgets to buyer at a dollar a unit. Buyer says, I'm not paying because the widgets are defective. Seller sues buyer for a million dollars. Buyer proves that 999,999 widgets are defective. And seller's awarded one dollar. Under the trial court's interpretation of the net judgment rule, the seller is a successful party, which is really an absurd result. And we cited the Utah Court of Appeals case. But that might be a reason to apply a different test, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the net judgment rule, that there wasn't a net judgment for one side or the other, does it? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the trial court judge could have looked at that and said, you know, this doesn't make sense. I'm going to apply the totality of the circumstances or percentage of success. And that seems to be the core of your argument, is that the net judgment rule didn't really fit this case. Well, I think you could fit. So when you have a claim and a counterclaim that are independent, like in the Trollope case, the landlord was the plaintiff suing a tenant for improvements the landlord had made to property that the tenant ultimately did not pay the rent on. The tenant counterclaimed for money that it had advanced to the landlord, money it had loaned. Those are independent claims, right? The plaintiff doesn't need to defeat defendant's counterclaim to recover on its claim. Sure. And it's a simple comparison. What did the plaintiff recover versus what did the defendant recover? And the net winner is the winner. In this case, you've got claims that are independent, I mean, intertwined. And I think this is where this court could probably provide some clarity on the net judgment rule. We have Berghoff suing for $49,000 for product and services that it billed for. We raised offsets for the same product and services that we said were defective, were not delivered. So for Berghoff to recover $49,000, it necessarily had to defeat offsets that we had raised. And so at the end of the day, the proper comparison is what did the plaintiff win on its claim? It won $779 versus what did, how much did the offsets were allowed? $48,000. What this trial court judge did was compare the claim of $49,000 to the offsets allowed and said they're less than that. That makes no sense. And so I think the net judgment rule can be used when you have claims that are intertwined. But you got to, you got to apply it properly. And if the error was you shouldn't have used the net judgment rule, you should have used the totality of circumstances or the percentage of success, we win on those grounds. We won 40% of the counterclaims. We won a bigger 
amount of money was allowed. You know, the alternative would be to award no one fees. That's 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 that is another alternative. Yeah. And you know, candidly, that's in the court's discretion to do. But it's not in our discretion. Well, I think I think I think it is. And let me let me explain why. So what the trial court did here was apply the net judgment rule improperly. And I think that is a legal error that this court can review de novo. And Berghoff agrees in their answering brief, I think at page 24, that that's a de novo review. The application of the rule is de novo review? Or just the award itself is de novo? The application of the rule is de novo. What if the trial court had been absolutely silent, had said absolutely nothing, and said the judgment is for $700 and I'm awarding attorney's fees? Do you have any claim before us at all? Well, abuse of discretion. In what? Just because awarding $50,000 in attorney's fees over $700? No. Is that the abuse of discretion? It's abuse of discretion when the defendant prevails on $48,000 of offset versus the plaintiff prevailing on $779 of its $49,000 claim. And the other reason I think this court can review this is the trial court did not sit over the trial. The arbitrator heard the evidence. The trial court decided the fee issue basically on the same record that is before this court. The arbitrator sort of fell into the role of special master in a way. This is an odd posture where the issues are bifurcated between the arbitrator and the court. But ultimately, I'm not sure that matters here to your issue. It's not the way I would like to see cases litigated, but that's either here or there. I wanted the arbitrator to decide the fee issue. They didn't want to do that. We couldn't get a trial date for those back in COVID days, so we decided just to arbitrate it. And I don't have a case to cite to you in this context, but I do believe you're in the same position as the trial court judge. The trial court judge didn't hear the witnesses, didn't hear the evidence. So all the reasons that you would give deference to the trial court isn't present in this case. And for that reason, I think that's another reason you can look at this. Except the Arizona Supreme Court has said that we have to give deference to the or the trial court has the discretion to issue a fee award, right? Correct. But we're not in a position to tell the Arizona Supreme Court to take a hike. No, I'm not suggesting that at all, Your Honor. But giving discretion doesn't mean not reviewing. Giving discretion, you know, there can be, I mean, trial court judges' discretions, discretionary decisions do get reversed at times. I'm fully aware of that, and I'm far from defending the practice of hiding behind the standard of review. I would invite you, since we have a couple minutes, to articulate a theory of that standard of review that is useful to us here. Because it seems to me, and I've said this before, it seems to me that the abuse of discretion standard is so flexible as to be almost meaningless. On the one hand, it can mean the trial court in good faith misapplied a rule of law, which sounds a lot to me like de novo review. On the other hand, it can mean extreme deference, and that only an affront to basic notions of justice can justify interfering with a discretionary decision. Where you fall along that sliding scale of the definition of the standard seems to me to be standardless. Do you have a different view? No, I think this court has, you know, can decide where it is on that scale of deference. But when a trial court applies, decides to use the net judgment rule, and applies it improperly, I don't think that 
is given so by government by expressing its reasoning the trial court has expanded the scope of our review if it had just issued a one line order it would have been more bulletproof well because because that concerns me I think I think the Supreme Court also in either water or one of those cases said you know the trial court really needs to articulate why they're deciding well the fee issue the way the Supreme Court also said the trial court ultimately doesn't have to articulate it's it's advisable but it's it's not wise right and and the problem that I have is in in the operations of the courts there tends to be this this sense that the less a trial judge says the better the more immune from review the trial judge becomes I don't think that's a healthy incentive for the functioning of the system and I'm not sure that it's even a correct premise well I think of a trial court and in this case the trial court did not do that the trial court laid out his reasoning so we know what he was doing and we know if you agree with me that the application of the net judgment rule was improper we know that he did that if he had just said nothing you know I think a court of appeals you know I think in part of the analysis of how much deference should we give a trial court judge could say to itself you know we're not going to give as much deference because he or she didn't tell us what they're doing and so we have no choice but to look at the same record that that well that's a new take on it that that is interesting try to I try to respond to your question you are doing so very well yeah and you're a good advocate which means the next time you come up here and you want us to affirm what the trial court did you're going to tell us exactly the opposite thing aren't you well I typically just try cases I let the appellate lawyers handle appeals I tend to make appeals not resolve them so yeah I'd like to reserve the rest of my time unless there's other questions I can address good morning your honor guy bluff and Bruce Smith on behalf of the appellees and you've asked some very great questions I much like Bob I'm a trial lawyer by profession and Bruce is the smarter one between the two of us he's the appellate lawyer and so knows a lot much better than me but I know the facts in this case so let me just kind of lay them out we were in litigation for two years with this underlying case just before we were supposed to go to trial we get a call from Judge Smith who says you know hey guys just want to let you know COVID says we're not trying any cases and we'll see you next year to which Bob and I and I apologize for calling him that that name but we've known each other for so many years said you know look we want to try this some other fashion why don't we just arbitrate what would essentially have been our what we would have given to the jury let's try it in a more efficient manner so for two years we were in front of Judge Smith and for three days we were in front of an arbitrator much like a jury trial so when you say Judge Swan that you know you might have used a different method I mean yes but given the circumstances it was not a bad method and the arbitrator was our finder of fact on some complex issues throughout their brief and there I will get it the arbitrator never opined as to who the prevailing party was he did not but what he did was a very detailed analysis and the arbitrator's award is a record on appeal it's attached to the joint motion to confirm the arbitration award the joint motion to confirm the arbitration award which is record on appeal number 70 and he goes through an analysis and here's what he did he starts with the premise that I was not 2% successful I was 100% successful on my claims and I know that because he starts with a hundred cents of my or a hundred percent of my claim he then goes through what were 16 counterclaim items and of the 16 counterclaim items he awarded on three of them we had conceded one for 400 a billing error for 
four hundred thirty two dollars we had conceded that and i'll give that one to them but i would have sixteen claims that we litigated actually seventeen claims we litigated my billing case which i won one hundred percent on i won forty nine thousand two hundred and eighty nine dollars one hundred percent we then spent the rest of the day three days litigating their sixteen claims of the sixteen claims they only prevailed on five maybe four and a half one of which i had conceded five at the end of that analysis the arbitrator did exactly what you said judge mcmurray he said he already did a net judgment he said mr bluff you get a hundred percent of your claims forty nine thousand two hundred eighty nine dollars the girths get five of their claims four of their claims forty eight thousand five hundred ten dollars my client was the net winner seven hundred seventy nine dollars which and it seems absurd that we had spent collectively what amounted to three hundred thousand dollars over what amounted to a final judgment of seven hundred and eighty bucks agreed however when this was represented back to judge smith which is exactly what the parties had agreed to we said we're going to leave the determination as to the reasonableness of attorney's fees to judge smith because he had spent two years with us not just the last three days and after reviewing all of the uh, applications for attorney's fees and the you know the china doll affidavits and everything else he made a determination based not just on this as if he were sitting as you are as a uh, a review of the record he was the guy who spent two years in litigation with both of us arguing motions across motions and motions for protective order and motions to seal and discovery motion he spent all of that time with us and when he goes through he does his analysis and his analysis was net judgment rule so on this spectrum that judge Juan, that you said where in the spectrum are we but there is two ends of the spectrum one is the net judgment rule which is just a mathematical formula it's pretty simple to apply but it still has broad discretion within with the trial judge in the appellate's um, argument of well if you sue for a million pieces and you only prevail for a dollar then i i think trial judges are pretty smart to start looking at the totality of this the litigation the percentage of success method in determining who's the prevailing party i was 100 percent successful on my claim i got forty nine thousand two hundred eighty nine dollars i sued for forty nine thousand two hundred eighty nine dollars they were only forty percent successful on their claims they sued after some uh, changes in the numbers during the arbitration process close of evidence they said we want a hundred and twenty thousand dollars they were awarded forty eight thousand I was sixty percent successful defending against their claims offsets counterclaims they were only forty percent successful in presenting their claims and offset so I was a hundred percent successful on my claims they were 40% successful. I was 100% successful even after the net judgment was applied, the claims and offsets. I still end up with more than they ended up with. They ended up with zero. I ended up with $780. So, Does it seem then that this is an appropriate case for a fee award at all? Yes, it was. Well, uh, despite what I will consider to be not a complete record on the settlement offers um, the it, the parties were entrenched in their positions and my client was entrenched they here's my bills they'd been billing for two years this job went on for like two years they'd been billing for two years At the end there was a this there was a unpaid portion of their billing um, in response we were bullied and attacked 
you know, we're going to give you nothing, you're going to give you nothing. The first settlement conference was, uh, the first settlement conference resulted in a, we offered to compromise our claim. We received for its settlement conference their threat of, well, we, we want $70,000. We were $120,000 apart at the first settlement conference. Um, yes, I do believe that it is an appropriate case for an award of attorney's fees because the trial judge who spent two years with it knew exactly what the parties, even called it the scorched earth litigation of the uh, appellants here. Uh, he said that many of my fees were the direct result of having to respond to the scorched earth litigation tactics. Yes, I think this is exactly the type of case that attorney's fees should be awarded in. We have the net judgment rule, I'm the winner. We have the totality of the litigation, I'm the winner again. We have the percentage of success, I'm the winner. Percentage of success is they had 16 claims, I prevailed, 16 counterclaims, I prevailed on 11 of them. I had one claim, I prevailed on it. No matter which method that you apply, absolutely, I'm the prevailing party. And in this case, absolutely, an award of attorney's fees was appropriate. Now, Judge Smith did not say, guy, you applied for $93,000 and you know, you're the net judgment of $779 and so we're gonna give you 100% of your attorney's fees. He, in a very detailed minute entry, goes through and does an analysis as to why I beat the settlement offer, which is the 12, uh, 341 rule. You know, you got to do that one. He correctly applied that. Uh, he, he did it a couple of different ways. And uh, Judge McMurdy, you brought up a very good point. You know, the, the, the trend is, um, my, judge, my brother is a judge, as you probably know. And so we have these arguments with each other. And then I tell him, you know, I wish it, trial judge would give me a detailed explanation. I, win or lose, I don't, I do care, but win or lose, tell me why I won. Tell me why I lost. Give me that detailed explanation as to why you're ruling the way you are. And Judge Smith did us all a favor here. He goes through and he does an analysis. And when he does that detailed analysis, it provides a better record on appeal and he finds in all his methods that I'm the prevailing party. So he did us a favor. I hate the one line minute entry just, just, just says, motion for summary judgment denied, or attorney's fees application denied, nothing further. It is bulletproof. Judge exercised his, his discretion. There's a presumption the judge exercised his discretion in denying it or awarding it, but it's not helpful. So here, I think Judge Smith did us all a favor. Their argument that they somehow, that, um, the, um, that, the, um, that Judge Smith misapplied the rule is simply not true. He did a detailed analysis of the rule. And Judge McMurdy, when you started this with, isn't the arbitration award already a net judgment? The answer to that is yes. It was already a net judgment. When you go through their analysis and their both opening brief and their, re their reply brief, they seem to try and guide you down this path, which is not accurate, where they say, well, Berghoff only got $780, and you have to compare that to what he was asking for to begin with, which was 49,000, so they're only 2% successful. That's not true. I was 100% successful, and then after applying just offsets and credits that they prevailed on in their counterclaim, there was a net judgment in the arbitration award. That's exactly what a jury would have done. They would have come back and they would have said, we find in favor of Berghoff and award their total damages of $780, or they would have technically could have come back with two verdict forms. We find in favor of Berghoff, $49,289, and we find in favor on the counterclaim, in favor of the GERS, of in the amount of $48,510, and the trial judge would have then done the math and issued a final verdict or a final judgment, which is exactly what happened here. So I, 
no matter which rule of this sliding scale that you want to apply whether it's the trollop case or the berry case or the all a case of the vortex case all court of appeal decision one cases whether it's schwartz no matter which test that you want to apply i won every single time and our trial judge we have to presume that his that there's some basis abuse of discretion and and i understand judge swan your argument that you know sometimes it you know where where's that line drawn in terms of it it's not an argument so much as a as a question i i invite many people to comment on it because i think the standard is uh flawed and often confuses members of the bar and the bench well as a trial lawyer i don't necessarily find it to be flawed um judges are charged with uh that i call them the gatekeepers of evidence you know they're charged with that discretion in terms of what is going to come in and what's not going to come in gatekeeper in terms of uh who's the prevailing party as a case like this again gatekeeper i i they're they're smart people um that you know have take take the time they get presented with a variety of different issues and so i actually like the the abuse of discretion standard it has cut against me many times when i've stood exactly in this podium but i still believe that it's the appropriate test and in this particular instance i think it was the exact thing that needed to be applied at the end of the day judge smith said mr bluff your clients are the prevailing party net judgment rule he didn't go on to explain the totality of the circumstances case because he didn't need to but on the briefing that has been presented i won 11 out of 16 claims of their counterclaims percentage of success method counsel do you want to address this mountain states case from utah and whether we should apply it here or adopt it or why it's distinguishable you you don't apply it because it's kind of a half test um and here's why bruce i'll let bruce answer this more carefully than me but it's not a complete test it's a guide and um so if it's okay with you uh your honor i'll allow bruce to address the mountain states case i'm going to uh turn it over to unless you have questions i'll um anything on relative to the cases i'll let bruce handle typically we only have one lawyer per side oh and okay i think i think you've made your points rather clearly okay fair enough well then can i have one second and now we'll answer your question that's right to answer your question um you don't get to that that particular case there's some dicta in it um and and in their think of their reply brief they say oh you got to take a look at the supplemental pleadings not really it simply says that the net judgment rule is not the answer in all cases it it's not i would agree it's not the answer in every single case we have a sliding scale of discretion for our trial judges in the net judgment rule case even in the net judgment rule case the in this fact i was 100 successful on my claim they were only 40 percent successful on their claims when you still do the math i'm still the net winner so when they claim that somehow or another i only won 780 dollars that is not true i won 49,289 dollars that's what i was awarded that's what the arbitrator found they won 48,000 dollars our spread was to begin with 100 and they wanted 130 i wanted 50 our original spread was 180,000 dollars between the two parties in terms of what they wanted i i still prevail as the net judgment i was still over that zero line um so i hope i've answered your question appropriately your honor thank you 
I have two and a half minutes. Are there any other questions, Judge Swan or Judge McMurdy? Because I've, I've made my arguments. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Quickly, let me uh, address uh, this notion that uh, Berghoff won 100% of the claim. They, they won less than 2% of their claim. In order for them to prevail, they had to defeat our offsets. I mean, just imagine if Berghoff had sent another invoice for $200,000 for product never delivered, and their claim was $249,000. And we proved that that invoice was, was, was incorrect and wrong and they're awarded to $779. Under that logic, he was really awarded $249,000. That, that makes absolutely no sense because the claim, this is a case where the claim and counterclaims are intertwined. You know, they build for products and services that we said we either didn't receive or was defective. Well, but, but he could have lost, right? I mean. It we're, we're sitting in a position where the $49,000 is a number that goes into the calculation. That number didn't have to be $49,000. Correct. I mean, it, it, it could have gone that he only won $10,000 and you prevailed on all of your offsets, turning them into affirmative claims for 30. Right. But what they sued so, here. So, it, I mean, when, when he says he won 100% of that claim, that doesn't seem to be inaccurate. Well, I think I think it was it was undisputed that they had billed X amount and my client had paid Y amount and the difference was forty nine thousand dollars. But the issue was, were they entitled to forty nine thousand dollars? That that was their claim. We are entitled to forty nine thousand dollars. Well, I think the issue was, did your client fail to pay forty nine thousand um, dollars under the contract? And then this, the secondary issue was, is there some reason that pre-existing obligation should be reduced, which you established yeah. to well, a great extent. Let me refer you to the Sanborn case. If there's one case I think you should read on this, that judgment rule business, it's, it's that one, Judge Boss, where the plaintiff sued her former employer for real estate commission she had earned while employed at a real estate company. The defendant asserted an offset saying some of those commissions were illegal because you earned them after your the plaintiff's license had expired. And when looking at the issue of successful party, this court compared the net recovery. The trial court agreed with the offset, awarded the plaintiff her claim less the offset. What Judge Voss compared was that net number to the amount of offset allowed, which is exactly what we're saying here. So I would, I would commend that case to you. Okay. Um, in terms of Judge Smith knowing the case, we appeared for him one time on a status conference. He, did, he didn't hear argument on motions for summary judgment. Uh, there was one discovery dispute that I think he, he decided without uh, argument. Uh, scorched earth, I mean, look at the settlement history. We offered a walk away early in the case, which is essentially what this arbitrator found. We then offered $10,000, which was ignored for over a year. Um, so I, that's laid out in the briefs. Um, the, the final thought I want to give you is, is, is this. this. This ruling would encourage a plaintiff like Berghoff to claim whatever number they want to claim. They could have said, you owe us $65,000, $100,000. And either my client pays it or they get sued. And if they recover $1, they get their fees paid for. And so one of the factors under Warner that we discussed in the brief is, does the ruling discourage meritorious claims or defenses? And I understand. And we're, I, we're out of time. Yeah, but, okay. but I thank you for our right. Well, time. thank you. Thank you both for your arguments. Uh, the matter is now under advisement. We will issue a written decision in due course, and we'll remain in recess to allow the next case to set up. Thank you, Your Honor.